Hello, hello. A very warm welcome on a cold day. I'm really delighted to see you all here. Uh, my name is Urs Gasser. I'm with the Berkman Center. I'm here with a fabulous team, uh, the student privacy team at Berkman. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to actually um, have a conversation together uh, about what is the state of student privacy in 2015. So what we're going to do over the next hour is really look at the ways in which uh, digital technology uh, has actually started to fundamentally change uh, education. And we'll zoom in on one particular um, issue, which is this privacy. Of course, we'll put that into context uh, as well. If you want to take a seat, that's totally fine. <laughs> So the game plan is, um, we start with a brief update um, and share some highlights of an initiative that we've been running at Berkeley for three years now, um, called the Student Privacy Initiative. Uh, it's been roughly one and a half years since we had a launch on reporting our findings, and so it's a good time to catch up. Um, we'll, we'll do so, however, very much in the spirit of, of using that just as a platform to open up a conversation. We're also uh, very happy that we have a few collaborators in the room uh, who have been working with us over the years, and we'll invite them also to share updates uh, from their uh, work, and then, of course, we'll allow for, for discussion more broadly. Um, there is also an online question tool uh, that uh, we encourage, especially our remote participants, to use, as well as the Twitter handle, uh, hashtag Berkman SPI. So just to uh, kick things off, here's a, a brief introduction of what the Student Privacy Initiative ha uh, has been about. Um, so we set out at a moment where um, the digital revolution really started to impact the educational sector. Uh, one and a half years ago, when we gave this presentation, uh, we compared the um, situation roughly to what happened early 2000 with um, entertainment. Uh, remember the moment where Napster was born and, and the whole digital media crisis started. Uh, we made a parallel of what has happened since um, roughly 2012 in the education uh, field with the Chinese industry. And so what we teamed up and became interested in is really to understand what are the implications of this digital revolution within education. Our focus from the beginning was on K-12. Now obviously today I think the emphasis may shift towards higher education, but when we started there was a lot of interest in what's happening and there still is, of course, what's happening uh, in K-12. What we've been doing at Berkman is, um, as we often do, it, is using our uh, role as a facilitator and using some of our community power to bring together different stakeholders, teachers, school administrators, technology experts, uh, privacy experts, policy makers, but importantly also youth, young people, we'll hear more about that from uh, Paulina in a few minutes, uh, to engage in a conversation. What are the opportunities as we introduce digital technology uh, to schools? But also, what are some of the challenges, especially what are some of the privacy concerns and implications? And most importantly, what can we do uh, in order to harness the potential of digital technology in education, but also safeguard um, student privacy? So we've hosted a number of um, roundtables or workshops inviting multiple stakeholders with the goal to map both opportunities and challenges with a focus on privacy and work towards uh, recommendations, good practices that inform uh, school administrators, teachers, but also um, public policy makers. So that's been uh, the project. When we started, there was, in 2012 roughly, there was one big topic, and that was cloud computing. At this moment in time, many schools actually started to use cloud computing technology, whether it's at the platform or infrastructure layer or at the application layer, uh, in the classroom. Uh, for instance, to uh, you know, using collaborative uh, tools uh, for the students, but also cloud-based tools to interact with uh, parents, 
uh, to manage the data of students, like the grades and uh, health information and many other things. Uh, and ultimately, with the goal to improve uh, learning uh, and education. So there was this moment uh, where um, schools started to work with private vendors, technology companies such as Microsoft, Google, and many others, and started to outsource um, their uh, data storage and data hosting. Now that process of no longer having student data in-house on-premise, but rather uh, work with cloud providers, led immediately to a number of serious privacy concerns. Especially parents were very concerned, and still are, uh, that student data may actually be hacked as it is somewhere in this cloud. So according to one survey, 87% uh, of, of parents are concerned that um, data stored in the cloud, student data, may be hacked or stolen. So there are lots of concerns. I see here a list of some of the issues and questions uh, we addressed early on. The second concern that came up immediately in this transition moment was the commercial use of student data. Many of the cloud providers, or arguably all of them, uh, are commercial entities, right? They do business. And quite often, uh, many of these companies, not all, have, um, have business models that are based on advertising, uh, analyzing data, and deliver uh, personalized ads to users. And so there's concern, and there's been a lot of debate, and also um, regulation and lawmaking, uh, to, to figure out how far should that go, if at all, so that data collected in schools is the basis for, um, for advertising. Very um, troubling, of course, some of these practices, and there's still a lot of debate going on um, how to put limits uh, to, to some of these commercial uses of student um, data. So what we've tried to do early on is, again, to convene multiple stakeholders working with industry, but also experts, schools, and the like, to come up with at least initial guidelines how to sort out uh, these problems. Turns out that one challenge is, and we'll hear more uh, about that, I hope, uh, later today, one challenge is that, as you can even get from this brief introduction, cloud technology is quite complex. <coughs> Uh, if you were to look at the um, contractual agreements between the school, for instance, and, and the company, these are complicated contracts. Often it's actually not so clear uh, what the company, um, the cloud provider, would do with the data. So uh, there are lots of questions that require a lot of time to work through for a school official or for a teacher. So what we hope to do with our work with many collaborators is actually to provide some guidance um, two people on the ground, how uh, to sort out these technological issues, how to understand the risks, but also to better understand how uh, good contracts would look like or best practice contracts uh, can look like. Now, of course, one of the char characteristics is also that the digital space is moving so quickly. And while we started with a heavy focus on, on cloud computing today, and especially over the past year or two, uh, we deal even with a more complicated set of issues. It's no longer only cloud computing. We see now uh, a very significant aggregation of data um, within different government <coughs> entities, including public schools. So you see a lot of data aggregation. Um, you see student information systems emerging. The most famous one is, is Imbloom. Many of you have, have certainly read about it. Uh, compiling over 400 data points per student. So you can imagine all sorts of data are suddenly captured from grades and school performance data to health and, and behavioral data, disciplinary data. And that, of course, again, triggers all sorts of concerns that now go far beyond the question of, May there be a data breach or may that be misused commercially, but rather, what about discrimination based on that data? What about predictive analytics and learning analytics? Um, what's the promise of that sort of new technology, but also what are um, the potential pitfalls? 
Um, we can talk more about the normative implications, but there, there are lots of concerns coming uh, together that are related to the use of data, no longer only uh, related to uh, the, connection, uh, the collection of data as in the first uh, phase of our work. So here you see a number of questions again that we've been exploring over the past two years uh, in the same mode of uh, having multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder conversations working towards um, uh, recommendations. In parallel, we've seen a lot of, of uh, activity uh, in the legislative arena. We'll hear more uh, from Dalia about that in just a minute. And that's only the beginning. Arguably the third phase, like Student Privacy 3.0, if you will, <laughs> is about to start. Uh, the first two phases, the focus was very much, and the conversation was largely uh, centered on formal institutions of uh, education, particularly schools, public schools. But nowadays, the digital technology enables us to create these connected learning environments. So learning uh, that happens in the social space or in the private space, that happens in libraries or happens in after schools or in, in, um, in city environments, now becomes connected with the learning experiences and the education that happens in formal education. So the key word there is connected learning spaces and technology builds the enabler of such a learning space um, with great potential, of course, especially for interest driven learning, uh, creating new pathways also for, um, for learning in schools and the like. But again, amplifies, of course, some of the uh, privacy concerns we, we already talked about. Uh, suddenly, you have very different players uh, working in such a connected learning space. It's no, no longer um, formal educational institutions that are heavily regulated by law, but startups, Silicon Valley uh, 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 tech uh, companies that of course have, have, may have very different interests in mind or, or different goals uh, than public schools. So the space gets more complicated, uh, that's the environment we are in currently. Uh, we can expand on that, but I just want to introduce it very briefly. The last point I want to make, just to give you a flavor of the kind of issues we've been looking at and some of the uh, takeaways from this initiative, and then we'll have uh, three quick deep dives into individual issues from, from a number of perspectives. Um, first, it seems to me that privacy has become some sort of an early warning system for uh, more fundamental structural shifts in the information ecosystem. Think back uh, the analogy to the entertainment and digital media crisis. There it was intellectual property, particularly copyright, that was kind of the issue number one when technology started to change the industry. And sometimes reactions like that, where, where courts start to get nervous and legislators start to get nervous when a new technology hits, that can be seen as a precursor of something deeper layer. While it was IP, arguably, in the entertainment industry, I would say um, it's privacy in the education environment that signals something is going on that is not just a transitional moment, but there is a, a more fundamental shift um, with respect to information and data um, collection, sharing, and um, analytical practices. In all that, and working three years on, if, on, on this initiative, I think one key takeaway from this like bird's egg perspective is certainly how important uh, it is to, to get the facts right. I made the point already, looking at cloud computing, the technology we're talking about is maybe easy to use, but not so easy to understand. Uh, what's happening in the cloud, right? Well, who knows exactly? Uh, we don't know how a data center really works. Well, there are some exceptions, so many people in the room know, but uh, <laughs> generally speaking, you know, we're not that clear what's actually happening in the data center. We don't fully understand what companies are doing with the data, so there's a transparency and the knowledge gap. Uh, so it's very important as we have these conversations about privacy 
about the benefits but also the risks of, of technology in education to inform the conversation by experts coming from very different um, areas and, and environments. If you follow the news over the past two years with respect to privacy and students, it's been largely driven by emotion. And uh, I, again, this may just amplify the importance, especially when we then start to talk about lawmaking or, or school practices, uh, that we really try to inform ourselves what's going on, what's a realistic risk assessment, but also what are the benefits. Another takeaway for me and for us, I allow to speak on behalf of the whole team here, uh, is um, the importance of multi-stakeholder processes. Um, and I want particularly to emphasize the, the importance of including teachers, but also young people in the conversation about um, ed tech and privacy. Uh, it's one thing if parents or, or policy makers or administrators are sitting together and discussing what's an appropriate use of technology and data sharing and the like in schools, but it's another thing actually to talk to teachers who who often are just really motivated and empowered by the digital tools that can be used to make learning experiences better. So it's very important in our view uh, to include multiple stakeholders and particularly uh, teachers and young people um, in, in these conversations. Student privacy is also interesting uh, uh, as an experience or an exploration because you've seen uh, how the law responds to technological change. You've seen that in the entertainment industry. I talked briefly about copyright and IP. You see it here um, with privacy. We have seen over 180 bills, new laws introduced at the federal and state level in response to the concerns I, I flagged. We'll hear more from Dali about it. So it's getting really messy and really complicated even to track the different bills. Um, so you see the law struggling yet again with this digital revolution as it happens uh, in this particular uh, area of society. Law, another key takeaway, is part of the answer, but certainly not um, the whole answer. And arguably, I would even conclude, it may not be the first answer. Um, as we are in a field that is so quickly changing, where technology is changing, uh, constantly evolving, where user behavior is, is adapting, where privacy attitudes and values of students and teachers are changing, law is just kind of too slow. It's not, it's not always helpful. So what we have seen and learned in our conversations is that there is really an important role for industry to play, an important role for schools, in school districts to play, uh, to come up with good practices or best practices as things are, are so much evolving and in flux at a given time. And we hope with our work to inform these debates uh, and we can go deeper uh, what some of the uh, things are that have emerged in the ecosystem that work and, and others that may not work. The final point I want to make is Despite all the activity we've seen, whether it's the attempt to create good practices, best practices, uh, to create clearing houses, to provide information about which apps are privacy friendly or not, um, to, to engage uh, in conversations about uh, lawmaking and good policy making in this space, despite all this activity, what it boils down to is that we still I think, need to have a conversation uh, as parents, as teachers, educators, school administrators, as kids, learners more broadly, about what are our values when it comes to education? What are the promises of technology for learning, for education? What are the risks and how do we balance these things? I think that's still uh, a learning process we have to go through uh, as a society um, to balance, and clarify the values, and also balance again uh, between competing uh, viewpoints and competing uh, values. And that conversation still, I think, needs to, to crystallize somehow, needs to reach a point where, where we have a better understanding 
Um, and only then, I would argue, also lawmaking can be a helpful tool, uh, because before we don't, uh, do really know in what direction we want to go, it doesn't make much sense uh, to enact new laws or introduce additional bills. So, uh, in that sense, looking at this list, uh, student privacy becomes kind of an interesting placeholder for many other debates we see currently going on about the regulation of digital technologies, about the benefits of the internet, um, uh, and also the, some of the risks associated with it. That has made it very exciting for us to, uh, to work on it. Um, again, these are some um, opening uh, highlights, high-level highlights that uh, hopefully give you more appetite, not only for burrito, but also <laughs> for the deep dives by, by my colleagues. Uh, we thought it might be helpful to approach it from three different perspectives, reflecting this multi-stakeholder approach. First, um, Leah, I think you will uh, talk about the perspective of schools and school districts and administrators. Mm -hmm. We'll then have um, Dahlia presenting um, and sharing views on, on the policy space and what we've seen in the policy and legal arena. And then uh, Paulina concluding with remarks about um, what are teachers and students um, making out of this. So, Thank you very much. <laughs> So I have a couple of um, brief snapshots that provide a lens into the bigger picture. So first up there, you'll see a plea that appeared online earlier this year from the teacher who runs the after-school program at a West Virginia high school. He went to a crowdfunding platform and said, I want Fitbits for my students in my after-school program. And he has a very thoughtful explanation of the country's obesity epidemic, West Virginia's, you, I think, particularly having a tough time with that, and how Fitbits would help his students learn to work toward goals incrementally at a macro level and also on a micro level help them achieve fitness goals. So his Fitbits got funded and they went to his students. Next, the snapshot you'll see is a report that came out in the Washington Post also earlier this year, reads, did the school principal mistreat little Johnny? Did little Johnny have it coming? Which I was a little disturbed by, but okay. Um, and let's go to the tape. And what the Washington Post was recording there is that schools are starting in some places, schools and districts, to have principals and other administrators wear body cameras. So that's something that we've been seeing certainly with our police forces and other public spaces, but now we're starting to see it in schools. And these two snapshots together illustrate a couple of bigger picture trends. The first, as we heard earlier, we're starting to see new types of technologies find their way into schools. We're seeing Internet of Things, sensor networks, robotics, and beyond. And we're starting to see those technologies find their way in both what we might think of as the front door. So I'm assuming that the principal who's wearing the body camera, the article didn't say, but based on conversations I've had with school leaders um, as well as industry vendors of products like this, is that those types of products tend to come in the front door. That tends to be um, an agreement that the school or the district is entering into to have their administrator use that product. Now, the first example about the very enterprising West Virginia teacher and his after-school program, that doesn't come across as something that was necessarily coming from the top down. We might think of that as a bit more of a backdoor, going in through a window, if you will, where you have a teacher who saw a need, identified a great product that could fill the need, and brought that product into his after-school program. Now, both of these different ways in have their challenges and their opportunities. So the opportunities being when you're talking about that front door or top down, you have more and more vendors entering the ed tech space with new types of technologies, with new uses, going directly to school and district leaders and saying, why don't you try this out? And in an era where schools are being consistently asked to do more with less, that can be very appealing. So there's an opportunity there. The challenge, of course, is once that technology is in the door, how does it transform the learning environment? And what new responsibilities are schools either implicitly or explicitly agreeing to take on? So under the body camera 
scenario, what's going to happen to all that footage? We've seen, actually, in my, in my home state of New Hampshire very recently, we, we've seen some litigation over release of body camera footage. We've seen that in many other cities around the country right now. What's going to happen in particular if that body camera is not worn by a school principal acting as an educator, but by a law enforcement officer, sometimes called an SRO school resource officer, who's in that school building wearing the body camera and still a member of the police force, but there with a memorandum of understanding with the school. Who owns that data? What are they doing with it? And what kind of accessibility might outsiders <coughs> have to it under the state versions of a FOIA or a right to know request? When technology is coming in um, the back door, as it were, you also see both challenges and opportunities. Opportunity, you have a great identification of a product, you get the need filled. Challenge, when I talk to principals and district leaders, they don't necessarily know what technologies are in their classrooms. And some of them get a little freaked out by that, some of them seem kind of more cool with that. Um, but the bottom line is that between bring your own device, which is continuing to gain momentum, between new technologies coming into individual classrooms, leadership at the top is really feeling a lot of pain around understanding what's in their classrooms, how it's working, what's happening with the data, and what their responsibilities are vis-a-vis -vis that data. And I'm, not, I'm not even talking legal responsibilities, but more normatively, how should the school leaders be thinking about that data so that they're continuing to advance their roles and responsibilities as educators rather than perhaps drifting over into becoming more of an arm of law enforcement or a broader surveillance uh, operation. Last but certainly not least, I just wanted to flag that part of what is creating, I think, this complexity for school districts and leaders is not just the ed tech that is being adopted in their classrooms or in their hallways, whether it's front door or back door. It's, school, it's students using technologies in their home, on the bus, in other places. So they're using their own devices. It's not that they're even bringing them to school. It's that, as a marketplace survey found, parents are saying almost 100%, 98% of students um, are using technology in some way, shape, or form to do their schoolwork. So data is, is everywhere. Um, and that creates another layer of complexity for these leaders. So I think one of the basic steps that we're starting to see school leaders thinking about taking or taking is just an inventory of who's doing what, where, why, and how. And there's some districts that are sort of light years beyond that because of where they've chosen to invest their time and resources. But I think um, when I talked to about 200 school leaders at the Harvard Graduate School of Education over the summer, that sort of initial step of serving was proving to be very important. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague Dahlia for more of a survey of the um, legal landscape. So bear with me a little bit. I am talking nuts and bolts law, and I realized many of you that's like, okay, time to go to sleep. Um, <laughs> But in order to contextualize all of this, I think it's important to understand the landscape. So where are we today? At the federal level, generally, we are governed by three federal laws. The first is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, generally referred to as FERPA. Just for a little context, this law was drawn up in the 70s. You can imagine the type of technology available in classrooms back then. Uh, it was really an attempt to create a framework to provide students and their parents both access to their education records and also protecting the privacy of those education records. So in the brick and mortar world, this seems a little bit simpler. Add in technology, it suddenly became very challenging to define how to comply, especially with the consent mechanisms which are involved in this law and some of the exceptions that apply to certain types of collection and sharing of information. The second law that applies in this space is the Protection of Pupils' Rights Amendment. Again, a little bit of context, the PPRA originally was intended to give students the opportunity to opt out and certain privacy protections around certain types of information that may be collected of student subjects and surveys funded by the Department of, the edu of Education. So again, this was a very narrow law trying to protect 
students, which often became subjects of research and other types of surveying because they're, a, you know, walk into a classroom, a professor wants a, a group of people to survey for particular research. Perfect, captive audience. So it was providing them the opportunity to opt out if certain sensitive information was uh, collected about them. Now, moving forward, the No Child Left Behind Act amended the PPRA uh, to provide certain protections for the K through 12 set, particularly um, providing additional opt-outs for parents, for instance, if information is being collected for marketing purposes. So definitely applicable when you start introducing commercial tools into the classroom or into schools. But again, it's an opt-out, so you can imagine it's starting to get difficult to manage both for schools, teachers, and vendors as to how to manage opt-outs, opt-ins, particularly imagine a teacher who wants to use a tool, historically, they didn't get everyone's consent when they wanted to use a textbook, but now if they want to use an online tool that may do rich, innovative, wonderful things, they might have a parent maybe block the whole thing or have disparate teaching environments for different students, which may or may not be optimal. Finally, we have the Children's Online Protection, Privacy Protection Act. Uh, COPPA governs essential, com essentially commercial vendors, and it governs how these commercial entities can collect information from children under the age of 13. Essentially, another consent regime in order to collect personally identifiable information from kids under the age of 13 uh, you need to gain the consent of parents, and that means a meaningful consent, whether it's a signed document and there's some other mechanisms. So, all good laws with a lot of purpose, but difficult to manage in this space, particularly with how fast-moving technology is. In addition to that, the enforcement power of the agencies doesn't reach all the parties involved in the chain of data collection. FERPA and PPRA are both administered and enforced by the Department of Education, and COPPA is administered and enforced by the Federal Trade Commission. FERPA and PPRA only apply to programs and educational institutions funded by the Department of Education, and COPPA only applies to for-profit institutions. So now you start thinking about non-traditional learning environments, and they completely are unguided as to what they need to do, which is why the best practices that Orr's mentioned earlier are so critical in this space. So what has happened since cloud computing entered the classroom? The gaps had been identified by numerous people, including ourselves, and so what has happened is flurry, and when I mean flurry, that's a little understated, <laughs> of state-level legislative action. In 2015 alone, as mentioned by Orr's, 46 states and produced over 182 bills related to student privacy. That's this year alone. So imagine if you're a school, and is it the law of the vendor that applies, or is it the law that applies to your school? Likewise, if you're a vendor, is it the law of your jurisdiction? You're in California, your server's in California, but you're trying to have your tool used across the country. What laws apply to you? If you're a parent, how on earth are you going to navigate this? You may have never read a law in your life. So, and then students, it even gets more complicated. So what are the challenges? I've already mentioned the enforcement gap. Uh, this is a challenge both for efficiency and also understanding of what laws apply when, particularly as libraries, museums, and other spaces are starting to take over some of the traditional educational roles. This is becoming even more complicated as well because they want to use technology to help connect people, provide access, all very positive uses of technology. Differing standards, again, what standard applies if one state has very low bars with respect to privacy and some have very high bars with respect to privacy? What should be the default? Where should, where should the law land? What are these laws based on? Is it data-driven? Is it not? Is it reactionary? Uh, jurisdiction is a huge challenge. Obviously, this is a challenge outside of the educational space in the tech sector, but it's something to be taken into consideration, which is why in a minute I'll talk a little bit about what's going on at the federal level right now. And the effect of in on innovation. So there are many positive uses of technology in the classroom. Um, we talked about using Fitbit to help students 
you know, learn fitness in order to curb, I don't know, childhood obesity or what, whatnot. This all sounds really good, but when health data and biometric data is being collected by a device that could be then shared with an uh, insurance company or other types of organizations, you can imagine the very negative uses of this type of information. So what are the... What are the norms around the information, and how should law be involved in this conversation? So, as I mentioned, uh, there's not only state act action happening right now, but in light of the confusion that's happening because of the many, many bills being introduced at the state level, uh, federal legislators have also taken note and decided to either Proposed laws uh, based on some of the state laws, for instance, so PIPA in California seems to be held out as a good standard. Uh, they're also proposing amendments to FERPA. Most of these are to both curb the use of or the collection of information for marketing purposes um, and also extending enforcement agencies' power to apply to companies as well as schools and vice versa to kind of fill in those gaps. Um, in my opinion, I think we need to think a little bit more cohesively about this in order to prevent unintended consequences both on innovation <coughs> and hampering educational tools in the classroom. The first is, if we're going to create laws, create laws that anticipate unforeseen technologies. As we're seeing right now, we're kind of in the situation because no one anticipated cloud computing in the classroom, Internet of Things in the classroom, you know, Body cameras, that's a new one. I <laughs> yeah. that, that is uh, a new one. I have a whole conversation there. Um, you know, laws should also be scalable to enable positive uses of technology in the classroom. What do I mean by this? So right now there's all this friction because of the consent regimes. And some friction, I will say, is good. But in other cases, it can actually completely unravel very positive uses of technology for students in the classroom. So how can we make laws more scalable? Our consent regimes or opt-in, opt-out regimes, which are kind of pulled from the commercial privacy regime that has developed in the United States, are those appropriate in this context? Um, I would actually venture to say that maybe we should think a little bit differently about this and think about enumerating positive uses and allowing those and enabling those pretty freely, and then creating friction only where friction is needed. For instance, commercial uses of information, um, and also creating security standards, et cetera, that would obviously need to evolve over time to address technological innovations and changes. Um, HIPAA's worked with that with some challenges. Um, that's in the healthcare space, but I think from a security standpoint, there may be some good work to be learned from and gleaned from that regime. Um, third, I think there needs to be clear enforcement and remedies um, to be established to incentivize the creation of systems that are privacy protecting by default. So what does this mean? Create remedies that are actually meaningful. Right now, FERPA, the remedy is withdrawal of funding from the educational institution. Now, how many times do people think that has happened? Of course, no one has lost their funding. We, are, we need to continue teaching our students. We need to continue <coughs> providing tools to our students. It's the wrong remedy. It's almost too strong, which makes it completely ineffective. In addition, we need to hold people accountable throughout the data collection chain. That includes schools, vendors, and also potential, and, and with, a, with a ton of education for students, teachers, and parents alike, as well as administrators. And finally, we need to broaden the definition of educational institutions to create a regime that's consistent throughout educational um, environments. That means include, maybe think about how we might define educational institutions to include massive online um, classrooms to include libraries, museums, or other institutions so that we're thinking about and providing guidance to the entities and institutions that are delivering these tools to our students um, with cohesive and consistent guidance to create easier pathways for compliance and protection of privacy. So with that, I will pass it on.
Um, so as Boris has mentioned, something that we really focused on is convening a multi-stakeholder perspective. And for us, that really means focusing on what teachers, students, and parents, um, not only what's happening in their schools, but also how they feel about it. Um, and as we've seen over the last few years, technology has become increasingly ubiquitous, um, but we're also seeing this context collapse uh, between the educational and the home and other various environments that learners are in. Um, so good examples of that would be bring your own device policies, where devices are being used both in the home and at school, um, or social media relationships between teachers and students or uh, former or students with their former teachers. So as this one young person talks about, she feels like her identity in the home and in school and among her friends is very, very different, and she would like to keep those things separate. Um, so she has very strong opinions about whether she would like to be friends with her teachers on Facebook or not. We also hear from young people that they are concerned about uh, college admissions officers and what they can see. They're concerned about what their parents can see. Um, they are thinking about privacy a lot, and it's really important for us to really respect what they think and also help advocate on their behalf. Um, so something we've really focused on, as I mentioned, is highlighting the youth voice. Um, so over the last year, we've been experimenting with uh, this week in student privacy newsletter that comes out every week. And over the last month or so, we've begun to experiment with using Medium as a platform to uh, highlight some of these youth voices in uh, personal essays and really think about other ways in which we can empower students and teachers and parents uh, to be heard by the policymakers and districts that they're involved with. Now I'll bring it back to Urs to talk a little bit more about what's next. So my suggestion is actually we open it up here. Um, uh, I also acknowledge that we have a few collaborators in the room who have a, a lot of thoughts on where things are headed <laughs> from here. And I was wondering, Steve, whether I could put you on spot uh, since you are actually uh, working in the business, so you represent the Cambridge Public School System. So um, any thoughts you, you want to share with us? Where have you arrived? Where is this headed? <laughs> Well, you kind of just described my, my work environment and everything I deal with every day. <laughs> um, so, uh, actually, I did want to show a couple... Uh, Are these folks here? Okay, um, so Leah had alluded to how some districts have put a lot of resources into this area and a lot of time and effort, and, and Cambridge is one of those. So um, last time we were here, we talked about the kind of system we have in place to vet online applications. And I'm really focusing on the 1.0 piece of the project, the, the cloud apps and the data. Um, so we have a very well-established process of vetting online applications that teachers are using um, and reaching out to every contractor, every vendor that is going to host any data and asking them to sign our standard student data contract. And another piece of that is communicating this to the community, to the parents, to the teachers, and all the stakeholders. And this is a public-facing website on the Cambridge Public Schools website that lists all the um, applications that are approved. Uh, and it shows uh, the applications, their purpose, uh, what grade level and content area, as well as the actual contract that's in place with the vendor, um, the actual executed contract. So we're trying to be as transparent as we can with the parents and, and the community. The, the next piece we want to add to this uh, website is going to be um, the data elements that are actually being shared with the contractor. Uh, we're just trying to decide at what level um, that makes sense to the parents, you know, grouping the data elements together, whether it's demographics and grades. And, so that they know exactly what's going on. If they have a child in sixth grade and ELA, these are the applications being used, this is the data that's being exchanged, and here's the contract language that is protecting that data. So, you know, this has been in development over years in Cambridge, and last spring when I presented, we, we, I talked about how we just began to share this with Boston. So Boston agreed to use the same contract as Cambridge, so we could say to vendors, if you want to do business in Boston or Cambridge, this is our standard contract. And then this past summer, uh, that worked very well. We said, why not open it up to all schools in the state? Yeah. 
And so we created that just as a grassroots effort, the Massachusetts Student Privacy Alliance, and invited any schools in Massachusetts that, that wanted to um, use the same contract to join and just you know, voluntarily say, yeah, we're going to use the same contract. So any vendors um, that they're going to engage with, they'll send out the same contract. And what we end up with is if you click on any of these um, schools, you'll see the same kind of list that you saw for Cambridge of what applications they're using, um, as well as you can search the database by application and see what school districts are using those applications, as well as those that have declined to sign the contract. So, and this is just starting. It's, as you'll see, a lot of these don't have things in there yet, but they've all agreed to do it. It's really just a few months old. And you see this as kind of a snowballing effect. Because as the <coughs> vendor signs a contract with Cambridge, they have now done away with that whole negotiating process for all the other districts in Massachusetts that have signed on to the MSPA. Because that, that piece of negotiating the contract with the vendor is a huge time resource. It, um, and, there is no, um, you know, I can't tell you whether it's a small vendor or a large vendor, um, whether they're going to sign it right away and turn, bring it back, or you're going to end up negotiating for six to eight months around the contract. So the more we can educate vendors and schools and come to agreement on common terms around those contracts, um, the quicker that turnaround will be and we'll, we'll get in the way of the innovation in the classroom. And then just lastly, um, what's coming now um, as we move forward, is that um, Access for Learning, um, which was previously the SIF Association, has agreed to kind of take that same model and expand it across the country. Um, for those of you not familiar with the SIF Association, it's a nonprofit that, that enabled a school interoperability framework. So it's a consortium of schools and vendors. Um, and it's in the US, UK, and Australia. And this would seem to be a perfect fit for them to take the MSPA model and extrapolate it across multiple jurisdictions in other states. So um, the first two states that have agreed to kind of uh, take this on are um, Virginia, Wisconsin, and Maine, hopefully, uh, will expand that MSPA model. Thank you so much uh, for this very helpful update and also for the great leadership role uh, you're, you're playing. Um, you mentioned transparency as kind of one possible uh, approach. And I was wondering, uh, Kate, uh, from ACLU, you just produced a report in which uh, right. transparency also kind of uh, ranks among the tools in the toolbox. Yeah. How far does transparency go and how much additional law do we need or what are other ways to, to deal with this hard problem <laughs> as we are in this transition? Yeah, so can I pull up the... Is this on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, my name is Kate Crawford. I work with the ACLU of Massachusetts. And um, we just recently put out a report uh, about the state of student privacy here in Commonwealth. Um, and because the beautiful tool that we were just shown um, by the man from gentleman from Cambridge did not yet exist, when we started looking into this, uh, we had to go through the long, arduous, and frustrating process of filing public records requests with a variety of school districts throughout the state, 35 school districts, um, asking for all sorts of information. Um, predominantly, though, we were interested in uh, examining the contracts between school systems and student information system companies, and then also we were interested in looking at what kinds of, um, frankly, malware is installed on the devices that schools provide to students. Um, to use both in school and take home. So we found, essentially we found what we were afraid of finding in some cases, which is that um, there's really a patchwork across the state of policy that is not at all consistent. Um, we actually, one thing that's really exciting to me about the Massachusetts Student Privacy Alliance project is that we found through examining, you know, this very long process of reading thousands of documents, we found that school systems that wrote the contract that drafted the contracts between um, the school systems and corporations providing third-party services generally provided more privacy protections than schools that simply signed whatever the, co the company drafted contract said. Um, and so, you know, 
we recognize after discovering this that uh, some school systems like Cambridge and Boston are probably better equipped, have you know general counsel who maybe has more experience dealing with these things than really small districts that essentially end up screwing their kids because they don't have staffing or time or whatever to, to really go through the process um, from the ground up themselves. So this is great. I mean, I think that what you guys have done probably is gonna go a long way towards addressing that problem that we discovered. Um, we also, though, discovered that generally school systems are not doing a great job communicating with parents about three critical things. One is what kind of information they're collecting about their kids, um, who that information is shared with, under what circumstances, and finally, what kinds of information parents can ask to opt out of the collection of or sharing of, um, and how that process works. So it should be very clear to parents that you know, the, the MSPA website is great. We would love also to see very clear instructions at the beginning of the school year given to all parents that lay out, you know, in simple terms, not a long contract or a terms of service agreement um, that's very complicated to read and most people probably, frankly, wouldn't understand even if they did read, um, but that simply lays out, this is the kind of information we're collecting about your kid, this is who we intend to share it with, this is why, and this is how you can opt out of certain kinds of disclosures. Um, we really want to see that implemented across the board. And it's not the case today. The last thing I'll say is that, um, like we feared, there, a lot of schools in the state are um, using key loggers and uh, filtering, um, filtering technologies that don't only keep track of you know, websites that are banned that students try to visit, but all web traffic in a school system or even on a computer that or a, a, a tablet that students are encouraged to take home and essentially use as if it's their own. Um, this kind of internet tracking we find to be totally repugnant, unnecessary. Um, on the same sort of tack, almost across the board in Massachusetts, school acceptable use policies um, provided absolutely no privacy protections for students and, and basically said students have no right to privacy on the device or on the internet. Um, we can search anything at will for no reason <laughs> at all, uh, and we we have a really serious problem with that. There's a Supreme Court case from the 1980s called New Jersey v. TLO, which is a little problematic because we think it sort of reduced the standard of searches in schools from probable cause to reasonable suspicion, but nonetheless, the Supreme Court held in that case, I believe it was 1985, that students have a, re a right to privacy in their backpacks and notebooks. Um, that school you know, administrators cannot simply rifle through a kid's notebook without any reason um, to suspect that they have violated a school policy. Unfortunately, that's not the case in Massachusetts today when it comes to uh, devices that obviously, as the Supreme Court held in this past session in Riley and Worry, hold much more information than a notebook or a backpack ever could. So our view is that schools should implement policies, written policies, that say that administrators and teachers will not search either through a student's internet history or their communications or their device without at least, bare minimum, reasonable suspicion that a student has violated school policy. So what we're looking for now is for Massachusetts to join the dozens of states, as, as you guys have said, that have passed uh, modern privacy legislation, and we're hopeful that that's going to be happening over the next few years. So thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Thanks. Great. Um, what I take away from your description uh, is, is that Student privacy is a shared responsibility, and uh, there are many players who have to be part of the solution. You also highlight, of course, the role of the lenders, and that that's going to be current theme. We are very fortunate, actually, to have Anna Levins here in the room uh, with Microsoft, who has been a participant and a supporter uh, of our student privacy initiative. And I was wondering, Anna Marie, to put you on the spot, uh, where do you see this going? Uh, obviously, Microsoft has been a leading voice in the debate about uh, student privacy, but more broadly, what's the role of the industry and where do you see things uh, going from here as we go into this kind of connected world? Yeah, thanks, for it. it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, back here. Um, the thing that's so interesting to me since you first started your <laughs> Uh, the thing that's so interesting to me since uh, the Berkman folks first started this research is how much the kind of conversation has changed. So when you first started looking at this, um, there was quite a divide about, you know, 
student privacy and what information is collected? Should anybody really be worrying about what companies are doing? And they're really now, in the tech industry at least, is, is, is kind of a consensus that you shouldn't be advertising to students when they're doing their work. And, and even more importantly, I think, there's a consensus that you shouldn't be profiling what students are doing. I mean, I, I understand the concern of the ACLU that maybe the schools are doing it, but, but I think companies now, tech companies, have come to the view that, yeah, that really isn't appropriate and, and we shouldn't be doing that either. So that's really a big step forward, I think, that we've, we've gotten that far. Then I think the other thing is there's a, a consensus around the ed tech world that they shouldn't be immune from the rules that apply to schools. So FERPA and all those regulations that have always limited what schools could do ought to be applied to the ed tech world as well. And then finally, I think there is an emerging consensus that we've got to figure out what it means to use student data to help them learn. And you know, there's all this potential about innovative learning and individualized uh, learning profiles. We've got to figure out what the lines are and what you can do with that and how it can really Forward. So, so I take that you know you folks are on the forefront addressing questions that really were important, and we've seen the world kind of shifting to say, yep, there there are some real baseline things we have to work on. There's a lot more that has to be done, um, but um, you know from from our perspective, it's really very gratifying to see our industry um, coming to a point where we, we agree on those those fundamentals. Thank you, Anne-Marie, also for this slightly more optimistic which <laughs> 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 is encouraging and so nice as well. Um, so thank you all for, for, um, for um, chiming in and, and sketching from different perspectives the state of um, student privacy. I, I would like to open up for, for a few questions. We have a few more minutes. Uh, other alternative viewpoints that haven't been uh, presented here. Do we have students in the room? I'm going to pass for this. I'm not a student either, but um, my question is Is there any consensus about who owns this data? Hey. This is my personal opinion. I think when we start talking about ownership of data, we really are having the wrong conversation. I think it's about custodianship. Um, in the U.S., Intellectual property rights, which is what usually people think about with ownership, do not apply to data. And I think it should be, the true custodian should be the individual the data is about. And then it's about who, as a custodian that has access to that data, responds to the agency that's being handed to them by the individual. So I try to move, I personally try to veer away from ownership because I think it starts getting into commercial conversations, which are ill-equipped to address the privacy concerns in this space. The other you want to comment on this? It's okay, we can take another question. I appreciate it, though. Dorothy? Hi, um, if I could, I, this is not my field, so I'm coming from outside. I work mostly with college-age students. I'm very interested, again, on how intimacy is achieved at college-age with everything that's now out there. But listening to you people, I was truly chilled because I had this kind of running sense of New Yorker cartoons of what could happen with what is undoubtedly a profound change in education, in the relationship among the parents, the child, the teacher, and the administration. And one of the cartoons I was imagining was the teacher says to this kid, you do that once more and you're going to the principal's office. So the kid looks at his body equipment, <laughs> says to his mother, what should I do? His mother's listening. And the mother says, tell the teacher you've got to get your lawyer before you go. <laughs> and the whole sense of the profound trust between a youngster and a teacher is clearly being changed. So it's more like industry. It's, I paid for this, I'm entitled to this, and this is what it should be. But uh, I want to direct everyone's attention, if you're interested in this field, um, Stanley Hoffman was one of the great professors mm -hmm. at Harvard for almost 50 years, and his memorial was this week. And one of his former students, a long time distinguished professor at MIT, gave a talk on what it is to establish eye contact with the professor <laughs> and compared it with MOOCs. 
and what she would have missed as an individual if she had never had Stanley's eyes. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about it ever since, for those of us of generations where everything is, what did the teacher say to you? Mm -hmm. What did he say to the teacher? And I just hope we can keep that model in mind mm -hmm. because everything that people said was both really exciting and chilling. Mm -hmm. And how do we maintain what's been the strength of this education system in the face of if I, if I may briefly, I would say that I think one of the ways we do it is to draw on a point Dahlia made earlier, that we start enumerating positive, acceptable uses of data, and we start also delineating unacceptable or negative uses. And I think through those kinds of conversations, not necessarily in law and regulation, but in terms of at the school level, at the district level, at the community level, we start coming up with shared norms and best practices that preserve space for mentoring, um, for epiphany, Right? We don't want data analytics in the learning space to get so predictive that somebody doesn't try picking up the trumpet because the program did tell them they'd be good at the trumpet. Um, and also to make mistakes and learn from them. I think those are some of the hallmarks of education that we need to try to protect from a values-based perspective through shared conversations to come to that kind of agreement. Thank you, Dorothy and, and Leah. We have uh, one question here. Hi, my name's Neil, and I just graduated from HKS up the street. Um, so my question is, I'm wondering if there's any consensus emerging around standards to anonymize student level data. Um, and I ask because, you know, oftentimes if you look up data on a state's website, you'll find it aggregated. Um, and that's, that takes a lot of the value out of it. Um, so, you know, if, for example, if you have student level data on performance on individual standards, you could districts could really do things like allocating resources more flexibly, like coaches or tutoring. That's just one example. So just, just wondering about that. The tricky business of de-identification. Yeah, right. yeah, so, so, so legally, I mean, this, is, this goes to who has access to the information and for what purpose. So legally under FERPA, uh, a school may have access to the data in completely identified way, right, because they have to administer education to their students, um, et cetera. There's also, in the presently existing laws, uh, requirements to de-identify, et cetera, with a certain type of sharing unless you gain uh, actual consent from the parents or the student if they're over the age of 13, or 18, sorry about that. So I think the constructs are already there to allow for schools' use of information for the purpose of educating their students, but also what are the rules with respect to ancillary uses of that information that do actually require de-identification and divorcing the student. Now, when we're talking about research, that's what the PPRA is intended to address as well. Um, and I think thinking about how to create, how to merge together the various regimes, you know, the IRB laws um, and the research laws to help facilitate robust research but also protect people's privacy, which is critically important when you're really thinking about w ways where very positive research could have very detrimental effects if that information got into the wrong hands, so. Thank you. And the story, of course, gets more complicated in big data environments where you have the risk of re-identification of uh, data anyway. But you have a question, I guess. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Devin Chafee, and I'm the executive director of the ACLU in New Hampshire, um, which is one of those states that has, in fact, adopted several student uh, uh, data privacy laws um, in recent years. And I actually want to recognize that Microsoft actually played an incredibly positive role in shaping the, the um, online student data um, bill that passed last session. Um, but I, I wanted to bring uh, the discussion back for a minute to the uh, quote that Paulina that had. Very briefly, please. Yes, yes. Um, uh, just about the right of students to have a private life outside of school, not subject to school surveillance. Because the quote of the 14-year-old that you provided was really not talking about her concern with what the school is doing with the data that they are collecting at the school, but about the, the student's ability to have a private online life that's not subject to school surveillance. And so we have adopted laws in New Hampshire to try to prevent that from happening to prevent, say, um, uh, schools from uh, asking students for their online IDs and passwords. But I was wondering to what extent has, has your project looked into that issue? Polina, do you want to uh, answer yeah. this and then also close the session? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have 
you know, there's so many different aspects of student privacy to address. That's one area we haven't really managed to get in depth in. Cade might actually have more information about that in terms of the school districts in Massachusetts. Um, one thing that we have found, though, in talking to young people is that many of them are, you know, as I mentioned, very concerned about privacy, and many of them um, have told us that they don't put things on the internet that they wouldn't want other people to find out ever. And so one of the concerns that I have is about how much of this self-censorship is happening, whether um, students are really feeling like they can express themselves online or where they can express themselves online. Um, so that's an area that you know, we would love to continue to study. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you have any other questions or concerns, uh, our email addresses are on this last slide. Uh, we are continuing to you know, have these conversations around student privacy and around some of these other really critical issues in um, these new learning environments, and we would love to chat. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.